Last week, I know that we talked a little bit about some of what God had placed on my heart over the last few weeks, over the things that we've been dealing with personally uh, as a family, my family, as well as many of your families, uh, and dealing with grief and understanding how, how good it is to grief and how we are called to overcome even in our grief. Uh, that there's a proper way of grieving. And uh, I encourage you, if you have an opportunity, it's already up on the website. Uh, it's available for download, uh, or you can get on our RSS feed, our, um, uh, on our podcast feed, and uh, place it on your podcast. It's, uh, it's available, Good Grief over, uh, Overcomers uh, series. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about freedom. To start this message, I have a small video that I, uh, that I found um, Rock Church in San Diego put together this video, and I just think it just really nails down the point of what we're going to talk about today. We've been lied to. And somehow we're okay with it. Have you looked around? I mean, really seen what is happening? The pain is real. We got used to it. Let me ask you something. Why are you here? Why do you keep coming back? Look in the mirror. Do you still see brokenness, addiction, shame, a state of bitterness and indifference? Do you think someday freedom will just come? What if one night at the end of your life you wake up, look around, and discover freedom never came? And it never happened. Today is the day. Freedom is real. You can have it. You can be free. But you must attack the system that sustains the injustice. The system is you. It's all of us. Freedom. Do you want it? Then receive it. And if you receive it, don't you dare hold it to yourself. Be concerned for the broken. Don't look the other way. And don't wait for others to lead. It's up to you. One human to another. This is what we are here for. This is what we have to do. Let's see this through. We cannot allow people to be demoralized. Change the course. Stop the demand. Get in the way. We are all in this together. Like you, these people just want to dream. Have a life. 
a name. Identity. To be set On the video, the symbols, the red was the sin, the oppression, the desire to feel needed, wanted, and yet being abused and taken advantage of. And uh, I like that statement. Uh, like you, all they seek is an identity, a dream, a hope, a desire, freedom. And uh, that's what we're going to talk today a little bit about, understanding and overcoming and living as overcomers, living in freedom. For it is for this reason that Christ set us free. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1 reminds us, what is the reason? He says, for this reason Christ has set us free. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Christ does not want you to live in bondage. He wants you to live free. And so we're going to talk a little bit today out of the book of Matthew and one of these examples that Jesus himself walked through, we know we have a great high priest, one who walked just like you and I walked. He understands the feelings of our infirmities because he felt it. He understands the pressure of, of this life because he felt the pressures of this life. He understands what it means to uh, deal with grief. He knows what it means to deal with, with issues that would pull us down. Uh, for some of us, it might be an addiction. For some of us, it might be... Uh, a uh, desire to uh, feel accepted for whatever that thing is. But we all deal with something, don't we? We're all, we're all ensnared. We're all trapped by our desire. And that's what I want to talk today about is our desire and overcoming desires because many of us, we think that the issue with sin is about the deed that we do. And I want to tell you that it's much more deeper than that. The deed is just a symptom of a greater problem. The things that we do are symptomatic of the greater issues that you and I go through on a day-to-day -day basis. Jesus himself confronts this issue when he's tempted as he's fasting to the Father. Read with me in, in the book of Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. I don't know if you ever caught that. I'm like, why would he? Yeah, let's go fast, let's go into the desert, so that I could be tempted by the devil. But Jesus had a plan in this. And this is, this is what he's focusing, this is what I want you to focus on, because he's giving us some examples of what we're going to do, what we have to face, and what we're going to have to overcome. The second verse, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry, or hangry, if it was me, now, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city. He set him up on the pinnacle of the temple, and he said to them, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give His angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered it to him and said, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up into the exceedingly high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then, 
Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and in him alone you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Over 2,000 years ago, a a Chinese general by the name of Sun Tzu wrote a book. It was called The Art of War. Uh, it's, a war, it's a book that's still being used today in many war colleges. The, the premise of the book is using the art of deception in order to uh, lure your enemy in a different path so that you can uh, overcome them and bring victory. Whether or not you have a larger army or a smaller army, the art of deception is crucial for uh, military in the military formation in order for you to reach your objective. In 1944, the Allied forces, prior to be D-Day, they, they uh, put together this thing called Operation Fortitude. Anybody know what I, I know? John, you know what Operation Fortitude is. Operation Fortitude is where they uh, designed these tanks and, and these uh, landing craft uh, very vehicles on the northern end of uh, England. They uh, have positioned them uh, in force to make them look like the Allied forces were going to invade Nor- uh, Norway north the northern part, and come into Germany from the north. And then they also positioned some further, deeper south, and they made it look like they were going to come in through France. Uh, So the Axis powers with their spy networks noticed that all these tanks were being put together up here, and they thought that the uh, the Allied commanders were going to send their forces there. So they started repositioning all their forces in those areas. Little did they know that those tanks were actually cardboard cutouts. Some of them were shells of tanks. They were uh, tanks that hadn't, they didn't have any motors. They didn't have anything on the inside of them. They just looked like it was a military formation. They had a communication station set up in there where they were constantly communicating back and forth, and they knew that those communications were being intercepted, and so they kept the ruse up. And so on D-Day, the, when they landed, when the, when the forces, the Allied forces landed on Normandy, they caught the German uh, defenses off guard. They didn't know that they, that's, that was where they were going to land because they had strategically misaligned the perspective of the enemy to one place. They thought that they were going to attack here, but they attacked here. For some of us, that's what the devil does in our own lives. That's actually the strategy that the devil uses. And and many times what he uses is he makes us focus on the deeds that we do. And for some of us, we get so caught up in the religiosity of, I'm saved, so I shouldn't be doing this. And so our prayers to the Lord is, God, help me with this sin. God, help me with this deed. When we miss out on the fact that the devil doesn't care whether or not you do the deed, what he cares about is that your heart and your intentions are in the wrong place. And if he gets you your desires and your will, your desires and your wants in the wrong place, it doesn't matter whether or not you keep Shoring up the one sin, he'll cause you to sin in a different way. So our focus doesn't need to be on the deed, it needs to be on the desire. The devil does that to distract us. He wants us to focus on the one thing that we will miss, that we, the, the things that God wants for us in our lives. In this way, we can experience spiritual bondage. We're not, we're not in bondage to deeds but to the desires or the motivations that cause us to do the deeds. Let me me say that again. We're not in bondage to the deeds, but to the desires or the motivations that cause us to do the deeds. For that reason, we've got to make sure that we're not looking at just the symptom, that we're looking at the, the source of the problem. That's why physicians, when they ask us all those questions, and we go, well, I came in because I had a pain here, and I had a pain here, and and, and we wanted them to, to relieve the symptom of the pain, but they want to know what is the source of the pain. Do you understand? And so it is in our own spiritual walk. We're, many of us, we're, we're so caught up focusing on the symptom that we miss the source. And we miss, 
shoring up the source. And what is that source? The source is the desire and the motivation. The desire and the motivation that you and I go through. People lie, they gossip, they fall into sexual immorality because of what is happening inside of their hearts. When you're, when you're in bondage in your heart, your poison motivations and desires cause you to commit poisonous acts. There's already a problem. There's already an issue. And so no matter how much you try to deal with the symptom of that issue, if you don't deal with the issue, you will never deal with the problem. You'll always, it'll always manifest itself some other way. So you may say, well, I'm, I'm, I finally got my, my porn addiction under control. And then you turn around and you cheat on your wife. What was that? You understand? You got the one deed corrected, but it manifested itself somewhere else. Why? Because you didn't take control of the desire issue. Don't think that you can walk around with a wicked heart, put in a couple of hours of church time, some good good religious deeds of works that are out there. And all those things are good. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that. I'm saying that don't think that if you do that, that all of a sudden you found found the cure to the problem. Because you won't win God's approval by what you do. The devil wants us to focus on our deeds, but God looks at what? He looks at our hearts. The devil wants us to focus on the one thing so that we'll miss out on the things that God wants for us. And we fall into that spiritual bondage when we miss out on what God is trying to address. And so when we look at these verses, I want you to look at this from Jesus' standpoint and what he went through and how he overcame them. So starting in verse 3, when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. Command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What the devil was trying to get him to do was a deed, right? Change this to bread. You're hungry. You're hangry. For me, that would have been me. I'm hangry. I'm a little angry. I'm a little hungry. You give me some bread and I will be good. Right? My wife knows that. (laughs) We've come to that understanding. We got some bread at home just in case I get hangry. The devil wants us to believe that our deeds define who we are. If we turn this this stone into bread, then you know you're the son of God. And how many of us find that identity in what we do? If, if, you become a, if you become the top in your class, then you will finally achieve what you've always wanted. And when we finally become the top of our class, we feel still an empty void in our hearts. Because the deed doesn't become our identity. It doesn't matter what we do. It's not what we do does not define who we are. It doesn't define who we are. That definition of who we are comes from our identity in Christ and who he made us to be. If you are the Christ, then use your own power to feed your fleshly desire. However, it's not our deeds, but our heart and our motivation that defines us. For this reason, we need to surrender our hearts to to the Lord. And we need to ask this question. I want you to ask this question to yourself. Number one, I am motivated to be better at what? than you. Fill in that blank. I am motivated to be better at my job. I'm motivated to be better than a a better, a, a better singer than you. I'm motivated to be a better dancer than you. I'm motivated. You no, know, nah, I would never be motivated to be that. I'm, what, are, what are you motivated to be better than someone else? Because the motivation, that desire is the problem. And if you're motivated to be better than somebody else, then you've now committed the sin of comparison. And how many of us try to compare ourselves? If you really are the Son of God, turn this stone into bread. Well, 
Well, I'm the son of God, Jesus could have said. He could have said, absolutely. Stone be made bread. And it comes out as wonder bread, pre-sliced. Mm. He would have been the inventor of sliced bread. I mean, I believe it could have happened right there. Jesus could have invented sliced bread. But no, he didn't. What does he say? What does he refer back to? Where does he go? Where does his motivation come back to? And that is what I want you to analyze today because this is where freedom lies. This is where freedom lies. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Look what he says. He says, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. My motivation is to do what God has told me to do. I'm not motivated to compare myself. I'm not motivated to to make myself something that somebody else wants. I'm not trying to compare myself to someone else. I don't care what you think of me. Because some of us, we're, we're in bondage to what other people think of us. How many of us fall into that trap? I know I do. I've got an ego. I know I'm, I realize that I'm a type A personality. I want to be there. I want to be known. I want to have accomplished something. I have dreams. But what are my motivations to do what I do? Is my motivation to get a name or is my motivation to serve? Is my motivation to to become somebody or is my motivation to be the person that God has called me to be? And this that's the difference. It's not about the acts or the deeds. Those deeds should flow out of our hearts. They should not be because we're trying to become a name or we're trying to do this. It's because it's within us. It's who we are. We're servants of the Lord Most High. We want to we wanna meet our, the needs of our community. We want to see those who are hurting have meet their needs and bring peace and reconciliation into their lives. It's who we are. We do it out of a spirit that flows through us. I want to challenge you this week to examine your motivations. Why are you doing what you do? Why are you doing what you do? So then the devil takes him up to a holy city, Jerusalem. Sets him up to the pinnacle of the temple, the very tippy top of the temple, the very top where he can see everything that is going on all around him. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it's written, you shall give his angels charge over you. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And he says to them, it's written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Second question I want to ask you today. The statement, ask yourself the statement. I am motivated to be more affirmed by blank than you. I am motivated to be more affirmed by my mom, by my dad, by my coworker, whatever that is, by rich people, by poor people, I want to be affirmed by blank. I want to be recognized by blank. And then question your motivation behind that. Why do you want to be affirmed by that group? Why do you want to be affirmed by those people? What, what is it about that that you're seeking out? What is your motivation behind that? So Satan challenges Jesus' identity by asking him to perform this deed. Do you believe what, that you are what people say you are? Do you believe that you are what people say you are? Throw yourself down. Go ahead. Jump off this building. See what happens. What is the devil encouraging you to do so that others will be in awe of you? Hmm, that's a good question. That's one that we must constantly, if we're to live the life of an overcomer, I want to ask you today, what is it that we're doing that motivates us for others to be in awe of us? Some people won't confront their others because they need to be affirmed by others. Hmm. You won't confront them because you want their affirmation. 
If something is wrong in their life, we don't want to set them off because we want them to love us. How many parents have ever felt that pressure? I don't want to, I don't want to say something because they're in a mood right now. And if I say something, I mean, I'm guilty of that. I'm guilty of that. I want them to accept me. I want them to love me. So I won't confront them over this issue. But if you're really obeying God at times, you will do the things that other people don't like. You have to make the hard decisions. Not because you want affirmation from people, because it's the right thing to do. There are times that we are called to do the right things, to live the right way in spite of what others might think of us. Remember we talked last, a couple weeks ago, we, we talked about why the Holy Spirit come as the greatest coach. And, and one of those things is to bring judgment into our lives. And what is that word judgment? You know, I, I, didn't, I didn't broach that, but it means correction. The Holy Spirit brings correction. Judgment is adjudication. It means to bring, uh, it bring, it means to bring closure, to bring, uh, to bring justice, and to bring correction. When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, when he, when he moves and he manifests in us, what he does is he brings correction. And many of us, we're afraid of that correction. We're afraid of even when he, when he causes us to bring correction into other people's, well, Holy Spirit, you're going to have to do that to them because I don't want to get in the midst of that mess. I don't want to deal with that. that I, I just don't want to lose that friendship. And the reality is that you'll lose the friendship if you don't do what the Holy Spirit is prompting you to do and so we have got to be people that are sensitive to the holy spirit even more so more than we are sensitive to others but we must be more sensitive to what god is saying and speaking into our lives than we are sensitive to others now i'm not saying that we ought not be sensitive we need to be sensitive to others and understand where they're coming from But I'm saying that if the Holy Spirit is telling you to do something, if God is prompting something inside of you, then you've got to move in that area. You've got to do what he is telling you to do. You've got to be sensitive to him and to his prompting in your life. Imagine all you could do for God if you were focused solely on him and never worried about what people would say about you. What would you accomplish in this life? If you didn't, if your focus was not on what other people's opinion was, what would you accomplish? I've limited myself by other people's opinions too often. I know that I can say that myself. And when I've, when I've stepped out, when I've gone and done something and that criticism comes, what's the first, what's your first reaction? Is your first reaction to back off of it or to pray and to seek further and to keep pressing on? Because there will be backlash. There will be always somebody who is coming against what you think you should be doing. And you must have it already resolved in your heart what it is that you need to do as as, as God is prompting you in your life. Number three. So he goes up and he says, I, you know, he, he says, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil takes him up into an exceedingly high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus says to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. So he takes him up and he shows him everything that he could have. And I want to ask you this, what are you, I am motivated to possess more what? What what are you motivated to possess? See, because the devil presented him everything. He says, you can have all of this. You can have all of it if you'll just bow down and worship me. And where where was he focusing his motivation? On the things rather than on God. On the things rather than on who he was serving. On who he was worshiping on who he was making a priority. His priority was his Father in heaven. While the devil tries to make our priorities the idols of this world, the things that we worship and serve on this this earth. 
Satan tempted Jesus with all the power and glory that the world could afford and offer him. He wants Jesus to want all of this, to lust after the things of this world. Many times having money and resources ruins people simply because it magnifies the opportunities to be more of what we already are. It magnifies the opportunities to have more, to be more, to, to, to climb that corporate ladder, to, to break that glass ceiling. We want more. We're in a culture of more. If you look at our culture, our culture is defined by more. We want more. We want better. We want, we want newer. We want more. I'm not happy with my iPhone 4. I want an iPhone X. Is that what the new one is out? I want an iPhone X. Every year I want to upgrade. I want more. I want better. And we're in a culture that magnifies that. It exemplifies that. I'm not saying you shouldn't have the iPhone X. So those, those of you who had the iPhone X, I have the Samsung S8, a little bit better than the iPhone X, but hey, we're not going to go down that rabbit trail. <laughs> but what is it that's motivating you? But you understand, what is it that motivates us to get the next thing, to do the next thing, to, to seek that promotion? Is it more money? More opportunity? Or are you content with where God has placed you so that you can be the person that God has called you to be where he has placed you? Now, if opportunities arise and it is a God-given opportunity, absolutely, walk in it. Great. You know, God does advance his people. But if you're seeking the advancement for your own sake, that's the motivation issue. What is my motive? What is my desire? Look, James chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own, what? Desires. He's lured and enticed when he's, when he's enticed by his own desires. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. Do you see this? So we want something, then, we, then the desire gets placed in the wrong direction, and then when our desire is so so ingrained and so focused on something, we eventually sin. Why? Because our eyes are in the wrong place. Our motivation for doing what we're doing is no longer for right reasons, but rather for selfish reasons. And so we fall into a trap of sin. And we fall into what Paul eventually defines in, in, in Galatians chapter 5, the deeds of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, this is what he defined. You remember we started out Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. It says that for freedom Christ has set us free. Well, look what he says a few verses later. Verse 19. Now the work of the flesh are evident. He says this, what, what happens inside of you, this desire that starts leading us down this rabbit trail of sin, of being bound, this is, what, this is how it manifests itself. So here is the source. The source is the problem. The problem is desires that are evilly placed. And then, then out of that source, we start to have all these symptoms. What are those symptoms? Sexual immorality, impurity, uh, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because he's saying that these are symptoms of the greater problem. These are, these are things that, yes, if you're doing these things, that means you are dealing with a, with a greater sin in your heart that has caused you to be separated from the love of Christ. And, and what does he say? What does he eventually say? He says, nothing in this world should separate us from the love of Christ. There's nothing in this world that can separate us from the love of Christ. So why do we let these things separate us from the love of Christ? Because they don't, they can't separate us from the love of Christ. What happens is that the desire to do these things has enticed us and lured us away. 
That's why he gives us an example later on, a man named Demas. He says, for Demas has forsaken the love of the Lord and he he has run away after the desires of his own heart, after the things of this world. See, it's all about desire. When we miss the mark, it's about where is our motivation? Where is our desire? What do we allow to keep our eyes focused on? What is, the greatest, what is the greatest problem that we're dealing with? If we're always just cherry-picking the sin, well, you know, this, today I'm dealing with this, and so God, I need your help with this, that we've missed out that God really wants to change our hearts. What he wants is your heart. He doesn't want you to be dealing with the symptoms of it because he wants to bring about true restoration, true healing true deliverance. He wants to break that bondage in your life. He wants to bring freedom. And as overcomers, we're to seek a pure motive, pure desires, things that would be pleasing to him. So my challenge to you today, as we look at these verses of scripture, Jesus refuted every one of these things by going back to God's word. He says it is written. Now the devil used the word of God too. And he twisted the words, but Jesus took the motives, the true motive of God's word. That it wasn't about selfishness. It wasn't about me. It wasn't a prosperity gospel. It was his gospel. Of freedom, of redemption, of wholeness, of liberty. And he took those words And he held fast to them. And he gives us that, that hope today that we can take the word of God for what it is, God's pure words to you and I to bring about redemption, freedom, and wholeness in our lives. And he says, my motives are God's motives. Away from me, Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only will you serve. And he closes with that. Him only. Not me. Not my wants. Not my desire to, for affirmation. None of those things are things that God wants for me in my life. He wants me to place my eyes on Him. And the devil left him. I like that. The devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to hold fast to his promises today. Promises of wholeness and healing, redemption and freedom. With every eye closed and every head bowed. Maybe there's somebody here today and you're saying, Pastor, the words that you've spoken today have really caused me to think about my motivations and my desires. Father, I pray, check my motives. Look at my heart and my desires. And if there be any wicked way within me, I ask for your forgiveness and I ask for your strength to overcome to live as an overcomer free for those who have Christ has set free are free indeed I thank you today in Jesus name thank you Lord Father I thank you I thank you for your grace your mercy and your peace I thank you for what you did on the cross